Right now, uh, having a freshly qualified for the United States Senate for a second term, uh, Senator David Perdue joining me. Good morning to you. Good morning, Eric. How you doing? I'm great. How about yourself? I'm good. Now, so you qualified yesterday. Uh, th- this is kind of turned into a, a big ceremonial thing in Atlanta with people that they wait until the last minute and, and do a big fanfare. You just went on in there. And, and decided to go on and qualify without all the pomp and circumstance some of these people bring to it. I, I appreciate you doing that, by the way. <laughs> well, I'm an outsider to this whole process. I don't quite understand the pomp and circumstance. I don't think our founders would either. You know, for the first uh, 124 years of our country's existence, Eric, you know, the Senate and the House up here only work 45 days a year in Washington. And uh, when we started electing senators instead of them being appointed in the state, that's when they changed to start working a longer term. It wasn't until air conditioning came along that actually the Senate and the House up here worked during the summer. So this is never, I don't think they ever intended, the founders ever intended to be quite the way we have it today. I suddenly have a Green New Deal proposal the Republicans should make. Turn off the air conditioner in D.C. <laughs> I can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> no, so you, you, you've you got an open forum here now from, from the North Georgia mountains to the Florida line. Uh, why run for a second term? You know, I characterize what you just said as from hay hire to high watching. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> I've been all over this state, obviously, since I was a kid, and I love being from Georgia. Um, I felt convicted when I ran back in 14 that the country was headed in the wrong direction, and I was right. We had the lowest economic output in U.S. history for eight years. We had de- demolished the military. We had backed up from our commitments overseas. We were, you know, giving people like Iran a pathway to a nuclear bomb. I mean, bad things were happening out there. And the second thing is I saw this debt crisis, and I just felt like with so few business people in Congress, I had to do it. And uh, I didn't know if I'd win, but we, you know, I think my first poll, Eric, was 3% with a 4% margin of error. You know, seriously, <laughs> it was, uh, as an outsider, it was a whole, whole new deal. Running for re-election is a hard thing to do. I, I mean, I, I did not take this lightly. I did, uh, my wife and I talked about it and prayed about it, and we decided that the work wasn't done yet. Now, you know, I believe in term limits as well, so I'm not dominated by this, this drive to get reelected. I'm dominated by getting results like President Trump is. Now, you mentioned the, the debt crisis, and it, it seems like it just keeps getting worse, and there, neither side really has an incentive to rein in the spending right now. Now, of course, we've got the coronavirus outbreak, and we're spending billions to fight that. Does it, do you sometimes look at it and, and wonder what on earth can we do up here with uh, the divide in government and even a lot of Republicans who say they want small government not actually voting for it? You know, the irony is that the drive to get reelected is a lot easier if you just give money away. Mm-hmm. And that's been going on for 50 years. The problem is, is that we have two, two budgets up here. We have a budget that has all the drama everybody knows about, but that's only about 1.3 of the total $5 trillion that we spend as a federal government. You know, the other 3.7 is mandatory. The discretionary part has the military, the VA, and all discretionary programs. That's ag, that's all of our uh, safety nets, everything else. And so we're spending less as a percentage of the economy on that portion than we were in 2011. So President Trump has come in and drained the swamp a little bit. We've fired 9,000 people at the VA for not doing their jobs. The problem is over in mandatory. That's Social Security, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, pension and benefits for federal employees, and the interest on the debt. And we need to save those programs because Medicare's trust fund goes to zero in six short years, Eric. You talk about this on your show all the time. This is a crisis um, of our own making. We can fix it, uh, and we just need to get on it right now. You mentioned uh, divided the partisanship up here. That keeps us from, from really trying to do these big things. So hopefully if we get Trump in a second term, we'll be able to get this done. Well, and, and you know, it, it seems like to be they refer to it as the third rail in politics, and I suppose it really is. A lot of you guys who actually raise the issue, you become deeply unpopular with core constituencies in Washington and lobbyists by by daring to even raise it and, and become demagogued. I mean, let's not forget even Paul Ryan, who wanted to make some reforms, the Democrats filmed ads of him shoving grandma off a cliff. Well, they've already done ads against me in my first campaign. Right about taking somebody's health care away or their Social Security. We're not want to, we don't want to do that. No Republican wants to do that. But what we've done by growing the economy, we've lowered the debt curve, honestly, by $2 trillion against what it would be. But if we don't fix Social Security and Medicare, and by that I mean save it, um, our, our debt could go to 30, 35 to $37 trillion in the next 10 years. That, can't, that just can't happen. The world won't let that happen. So we, this is serious. We've got to get on it. Growing the economy is the first step. Trump's on that. We've done that. 
uh, it's moving. The coronavirus is a is a problem, and we're going to you know you're going to hear the governor and others talk about that later in your show. But uh, the economy is moving very well. In the last two and a half years, three years really, two and a half million people have pulled themselves out of poverty because we've created opportunities. And actually, I believe if we can get momentum and keep it keep the momentum over the next four years. We can do a lot more in terms of getting more people to work and also fixing things like immigration and our infrastructure. Senator, I've picked up a couple more stations down down along south the South Georgia line, and I hear from those stations that the farmers down there, they're starting to get some of the federal aid that had been held up over Hurricane Michael. But there's still a lot of frustration down there with the federal government helping farmers through some of these situations. And now, of course, the mild winter puts in jeopardy whether or not the peaches are going to be good, and farmers are starting to stress about that. And then you've got all the rain – it's flooding fields. Uh, what are you? What are you looking at as, as a senator down in South Georgia when it comes to dealing with the situation with farmers? Well, what, everything you just mentioned is is what farmers have to deal with. Unfortunately, uh, that's what makes it such a God given uh, career. Uh, unlike what Michael Bloomberg right. says, you don't just put a seed in the ground, throw water at it, and then everything works out fine. I mean, any of us that ever worked on a farm know better than that. Um, Georgia farmers are the best in the in the world, really. We've got great dirt. We've got great people. Normally, we have pretty good weather, and it works. We've had some really outstanding uh, travesties happen here in the last couple of years. I'm very frustrated. The bureaucracy is still alive and well. The Secretary of Agriculture has been working feverishly. The governor, uh, I, uh, others have been really on this. It just shows that the deep state is here, and uh, it takes a long time to, to, to deal with that. The bureaucracy is what slowed all this down. I give President Trump a lot of credit, though, because he broke through that logjam in the very beginning, and, or else we'd still be sitting here debating how much we could give to the farmers. Listen, Senator, I, I would love to spend more time with you, but we've got the wild card coronavirus situation, and we've got the, the governor and, and the, the commissioner from Department of Public Health coming in here in a little bit to give us an update. But, man, I appreciate you stopping by, and I sure appreciate what you do and, and look forward to anything I can do to help you. I'm just excited to have you on the ballot. Well, Eric, look, thanks so much. You're, you're one of the few people around that get the truth out, and that I think it's so important. I get asked this question all the time. Where do I go to get my facts? Where do I get information? And, I, you know, I, call them, I point them to your show and a few others that, that really are focused on facts, regardless of the political dimension of it. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Good luck to you. Senator Amen. David Perdue 